Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord, God Almighty. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We worship you, Lord God. Lord, not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit of the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God in the highest. Blessed be his holy name. We honor you, Jesus. We glorify you, Lord God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to you, Jesus. Lord, you're so worthy. Thank you, Lord God. We honor your name, O oh God. You're worthy, King Jesus. There's no one like you in all the earth. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Good evening, uh, Cousin Kenny. God bless you. Uh, Minister Joe, God bless you. Thank you for joining tonight. Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, we're not going to prolong the time. The Bible tells us where there's two or three gathered in the name of the Lord. He is in the midst. I pray that you all had a wonderful, a joyous day. The weather's nice outside. Over here where I live at, it's always cool because we get that lakefront air that comes over here. But it's really, really nice over here. And um, the sun is shining. God is doing a great work over here in the Milwaukee area, changing lives and changing the mindsets of people who have a hunger and thirst for righteousness to be filled. We serve a mighty God and sovereign God, holy God. And all you got to do is walk by faith and not by sight into the promises of God's word every day. So let's open up in a word of prayer. So Father, in the name of Jesus, God, I thank you for this day you have created. I thank you for your mercy and your grace bestowed upon us, God. I thank you for your goodness that draws men to repentance. Tonight, Father God, as we engage in your word, we ask that you feed us like a shepherd feeds his flock, oh God. Not only that, Lord God, but change mind, change heart, change life for the better, oh God. After hearing this word, that we'll not be the same again. Lord, we thank you that you defeated all of our foes. You gave us the victory in Christ Jesus. And all we have to do is rest in the finished work of the cross, knowing with confidence and boldness that greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. We bind every demonic force, every attack, every assault that will come against your people right now, God. Every sickness, every disease, oh God, that the enemy try to bring against your people, God, that you will set them free in the inner man, oh God. In the mighty name of Jesus, we claim the victory, God. We claim it by faith in Jesus' name. And we thank you, God, that you're working in our lives to will and do according to your good pleasure. Father, we ask that you give us clear air access to the airways now, God. Your word tells us that the enemy has been given the authority, the prince of the air. But God, tonight we take authority of the airways from this live stream that will not continue to keep buffering, oh God, but they'll have clear clarity, Father, to bring forth your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Again, again, I thank you for joining us tonight for our Bible study once again. Last week we were talking about uh, false prophets. We we're talking about um, informational information people, how people are so caught up in themselves. It's an information generation who, who looks for 
knowledge but never gain the truth of God's word because we're seeking everything but God to satisfy our flesh. And God wants us to have a hunger and a thirst for righteousness that only he can feel and satisfy. And when you know that you have been transformed by the spirit of living God from the mind of the world, and we have the mind of Christ, the only information we need to learn is the word of God. The Bible tells us, 2 Timothy, Timothy chapter 3, verse 7, that people are ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And the reason why is because they're not hungry and thirsting after righteousness to be filled. They're hungry and thirsting after the things the world can offer them, what the enemy presents to them, lays at their table, and then filling their fleshly desires up with the things of the world with absence of God. But one thing about the word of God, he said, blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness. They shall what? Be filled. Filled with what? With the knowledge, with the wisdom with the truth of God's word that has the ability to change your entire life, to change your situation. And all you got to do is just trust God and stand on his word. Because so many people are looking for doctors that satisfy their itching ears. We talked about that last week, how in this generation, people are looking for signs and wonders only for their own gratification. But the sign that's going to be given to us on today it's the word of God to show us that we are children of the most high God, that we have the power of the anointing living in our lives to manifest God's glory through our lives. And when you walk in obedience to God's word, that's why it's very important to study. Study the word of God. Know the word of God. Learn the word of God. Memorize the word of God. Because when you put the word in your spirit, the word of God will, will guard you and protect you from the attacks the enemy may bring from any different avenue, television, radio, people, association, doesn't matter where it comes from, it's coming from an entity to distort your vision. Not only distort your vision, but to block your purpose from manifesting as God has called you out of darkness to the marvelous light. We need to be aware of the enemy's tactics because there are wolves and sheep clothing who are looking for weak sheep who is vulnerable, who has no strength to fight for themselves. Jesus put it this way in St. John chapter 10, verse 10, but the thief come not about only to kill, steal, and destroy. The thief, who is the thief? The enemy, the devil, the one who's looking about roaring like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. That's the thief. But he said, I am come that you might have life, and have it more abundantly. So in order to receive this new life abundantly, you got to allow the Spirit of God to get in your heart, to change your heart. God told Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25, so I'm going to sprinkle clean water upon you, and you'll be cleansed from all your filthiness, from all your idols. He says, and you will be clean. Why? Because in order to be clean, we got to hear the word. How can you hear the word and not be clean? If you're not paying attention, not applying the word to your life, you'll never find yourself being washed clean from your filthy ways or iniquity. It's very important as a child of God to allow the spirit of God to get in your heart, to transform your mindset. Because the greatest weapon the enemy uses against you, against me, is right here. The mindset. That's what attacked us the most. When Paul wrote to the church, when he's telling Timothy, warning him, don't get caught up in old wise fables, don't get caught up in arguments over the word of God, but preach the truth in season, out of season, regardless of when you feel like it, when people make you feel intimidated, whether they want to ostracize you, they want to talk about you, they want to scandalize your name, keep on preaching the truth. Because if you stand on the truth, Jesus made it clear and told Paul to write this in one of his writings. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall what? Set you free. You cannot be free without getting an understanding and a revelation of the truth of God's word. It's very important, very vital to your Christian growth to get the word of God inside of your heart. Because the word gets in your heart, it begins to sprout roots like a tree that's planted. You can take a little bitty tree, a little small tree, 
and you take the soil, you till the soil, and you plant that tree in the soil, that tree is going to begin to draw from the substance of the soil to be nurtured. And once it's nurtured, what happens? It slowly begins to sprout roots. And when the roots begin to spread, then you got a bud coming up from that tree to let you know that it's starting to manifest, starting to grow. It's the same way in the Christian life. When you first come to Christ Jesus, the word has to be sown in your heart like a seed. Once that seed is in your heart, it goes through the process, the germination process, and begins to sprout roots in your heart. And once it sprouts those roots, then it begins to bud in your life, the manifestation of the transformation. That was good right there. Somebody just missed that. Once the root begins to sprout, the manifestation of the transformation comes forth out of your life to let people know that, hey, I'm a child of God. I've been born again. Jesus told the disciples, it is very important, read it in St. John chapter 15, to stay connected to the vine. Chapter, verse, chapter 15, verse 1. So unless you bind the vine, you cannot bear fruit. Why? Because you get disconnected from the root. You disconnect any plant from its root. What's going to happen? It's going to die. Why? Because it has no power, has no substance, it's not being nurtured, and it's disconnected. That's the same way as a child of God. <coughs> you get disconnected from the body of Christ What's going to happen? Your roots begin to dry up because you're putting yourself from the substance of the Spirit of God that has the ability to nurture you. In 2 Timothy, I'm going to read this scripture and we're going to go to the next subject tonight. We're going to talk about betrayal. Talk about betrayal. We all, can, we all have a story about some type of betrayal that took place in our lives or the lives of somebody else that we know of. And this is something we need to be aware of because the enemy is very cunning and very crafty. And he knows exactly what buttons to push to make you get out of character, make you lose your position in Christ, and get you to a place where you stop growing in Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and it says this here, in the New, New International Version, it says, but mark this, chapter, chapter 3, verse 1, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. How many agree that we're living in the last days? Send us some thumbs up or something to indicate you, you believe this. We're living in the last days. He says, people will be lovers of themselves. We've seen many people, you may know somebody that's like that is close to you, always talking about themselves, always boasting about themselves, always gratifying themselves, always lifting themselves up. Why? Because they became a lover of themselves. Lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents. In today's society, a lot of these young people have become so reckless and disrespectful to adults as well as their parents because their hearts is filled with so much iniquity. They have dis dis disconnected themselves from the spirit of obedience. Many of you don't know that's the spirit of obedience and the spirit of disobedience. And a lot of children, look at these reckless drivers. Who, who's calling the wrecks? These children who stole somebody's car. Why? Because they got to the place where they feel they grown. They feel they can do what they want to do. They don't care about nobody else's property. Don't care about you. Don't even care about themselves. All they want to do is a quick fix and a fix, quick thrill. So they're going to steal somebody's car and it caused a major wreck and killed somebody else's life. And guess what? They live. It's very rare 
You hear about young people today who done stole somebody's car and, and they didn't die in the accident. But then it says ungrateful, unholy. Why are they ungrateful? Because they don't care about them nobody else. They're ungrateful because they're not satisfied with how the parents raised them. They're not satisfied what the parents give them. I want the best name brand products. I want the best Jordans. I want the best Nikes. <coughs> All this stuff because they want themselves to look so good on the outside, but the inside is filthy. It's unclean. It's messed up. It's bankrupt. It's dead. So you got a lot of zombies walking around in society who don't care about nobody else because they don't care about themselves. So they're unholy. Anything is unholy is unpure. It's unclean. It's tainted. So if you're not holy, then you're unholy. So without love, verse 3, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, verse 4, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. So I rather love pleasure to make my flesh feel good then connect to God who provides the goods. So I'd rather fill my flesh up with all the things the world has to offer me and leave God on the outside. I don't want him coming to my house because in my house, we're lovers of ourselves. In my house, we're lovers of pleasure and we don't love God. So it goes on, says having a form of godliness. Verse 5, have a form of godliness, but denying its power, having nothing to have nothing to do with such people. There's a stern warning that Paul gave Timothy. It says, have nothing to do with people of this type of behavior. Then you go to chapter 4, my God, my God. Chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. I'm going to start at verse 2. He said in verse 2, preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Paul gave Timothy his marching orders as a pastor, as a shepherd, as a leader, he need to preach the word. Whether he feel like it or he don't feel like it, preach the word. You go to verse one, it says in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who would judge the living and the dead and in the view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. The King James said, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead as his appearing and his kingdom. Talking about the return of Christ. He's going to judge the world. He said, preach the word, be instant in season, always ready, always on guard, out of season, reprove. That's another word for correct. Rebuke. That means correct. It don't mean to come down harsh, but it means to punish with love. Exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Why? Because if I have great patience, I'm not quick to fly off the handle when things ain't going my way. I'm not quick to get mad at folk when they mistreat me. I'm not quick to get out of character when they do me wrong. Why? Because I have great patience. Great patience with long suffering is standing on the word of God that he says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. So if God promises when your enemy comes against you that he's going to take care of, then you need to just learn how to rest in the finished work. What Christ already done at the cross, and when he rose from the dead, he gave us victory. So the victory, it can't be taken from you until you let go of it. 
So you take your victory and you stand in that victory. So when the enemy comes against you, I rebuke this unclean spirit in the name of Jesus. I'm not going to entertain you today, devil. Loose this person. Let him go free in Jesus' name. Guess what happens? You gave the power to God to overcome the enemy who's coming against you. Trust me, many times I encounter people who I have to do just that. Speak a word of rebuke by the Spirit of God and command that spirit to loose them and let them go. Because I was not going to entertain, I was not going to fight with people. Because sometimes people would provoke you to want to fight them. Because they know your, tr your, your, your trigger point. They know what it is you got inside of you that makes you quick to fly off the handle. Make you quick to get out of your attitude, get into a bad attitude. They know exactly what to say to you to make you upset. And then you fall prey to what the enemy was trying to do in the first place. So you give up and you give in to the voice of the enemy and engage in confrontation. And before you know it, it gets out of hand. Now you're mad at each other or you cussed each other out or you don't fault each other. So it's very important as a child of God. To stay on guard. For he says in verse 3, chapter 4, verse 3, says, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. For the time will come. We're looking at that time right now. When people will not put up with sound doctrine. They're not going to tolerate it. They're not going to desire it. They're not going to want it. The reason why so many people make excuses for not going to church today is because of Corona. Why? Because I don't want to go to church. But I can go to the grocery store. I can go to Walmart. I can go to the Goodwills. I can go to the malls. I can do everything my flesh want to go. Go sit in the restaurant around all those people who you may, don't even know may have Corona. But I don't want to go to church. So I make my excuse for not going to church because I'm not giving to the voice of the Spirit. I'm giving to my flesh and desire. My flesh says stay home. The Spirit of God says go to church. So I listen to the voice of the flesh instead of the voice of the Spirit. Why? Because we're coming to a time where people would not put up a sound doctrine. Instead, check this out. Instead, to suit their own desires, they would gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want them to hear. In the King James, verse 3, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, they heap to themselves teachers. That means many teachers, a multitude of teachers, having itching ears. Verse 4 says, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth. And shall turn unto fables. In the NIV, it says they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myth. Fables. False doctrine. Lies cunning messages all because I want to satisfy this here the flesh the soul mind and not the spirit mind and God is saying tonight we need to wake up as the people of God stop being an information generation who only wants information but don't want to follow the truth you got folk who are arguing and debate with you over the word of God they look for reasons for confrontation over the word of God to try to demise your belief in Christ. So if Paul was here today, he would grieve to see what, the, what he had foretold that have came to pass. So we want to talk about betrayal. The first thought came to mind about the bait of Satan in betrayal was Judas, how he betrayed Jesus. Jesus knew that Judas had an assignment to betray him in order to fulfill the prophecies for him to become the Messiah, to die on a cross, go in a grave, and rise again the third day. So he had to be betrayed. He had to go through the process 
of having somebody turn their back on him. And that was Judas. Because Judas did not have a desire to follow Christ wholeheartedly. He only followed him because of the fame and who Jesus was and what Jesus could do. But his heart was not in it. And he calls it this. It says in Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 24, verse 10. Glory to God. This is going to set somebody free tonight. It's going to set you free. Chapter, four, chapter 24, verse 10. And it says, at that time, this is NIV, at that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. At that time, we're living in that time, where many people are betraying each other. They're turning on each other. They're fighting each other. They're feuding with each other because they don't have the love of God in their hearts. He says they will turn away from the faith and will betray each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. My God, my God. We're living in those days that was prophesied that should come to pass. Where people are becoming less lovers of God and hating one another, betraying one another. Quick to tell on one another. Instead of praying for somebody who has a problem or an issue in their life, I'm quick to be a talebearer and tell everybody about their weakness. Tell everybody about their trouble. Tell everybody about their sorrows. Tell everybody about their pains. I'm quick to spread rumors. Instead of having the facts or doing what the words say, interceding for one another, I'm quick to tear them down. Why? Because they have become offended. In the King James, it says, And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and hate one another. Why? Because offense will lead you to betrayal. When I become offensive to anybody because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it calls them to turn against me even though I haven't done anything wrong. Why? Because of the conviction. The Holy Spirit, when you know you're out of order with God, and the Lord sends someone to you to tell you a prophetic word to get your house in order, get your life back straight with Christ, we become offended. Who they think they're talking to? God could have told me that himself. I don't need nobody to tell me what I'm doing wrong. I know my life better than anybody else. How many times have we had that attitude? When God says a word of correction to get you back on track, to get you back in the place of consecration, your attitude flare up. So your attitude reach a certain altitude which cause you to reach heaven with a negative attitude. And God says, okay, fine. You want to come in with this negative attitude? I got something for you. I'm going to send a word of rebuke. I'm going to say a word to get you back on track, a word to correct you, a word to even chastise you. Why? Because i got to get you straight in order to come to the kingdom, to live in the kingdom and come to live in glory. You cannot live in the presence of God with a filthy heart. You cannot live in the presence of God and expect to go to heaven when you die in your life. You're still holding on animosity, still holding on unforgiveness, still being selfish, still being stingy, still being prideful, haughty, arrogant, hating on one another. God says tonight, let it go. The Spirit of God is coming to let us know tonight that you need to get out of that spirit of betrayal because the enemy betrays us every day to make us think if I let down my guard, I start living according to the dictates of my flesh, then I can live the way I want to live and God still bless me. Wrong. It don't work like that. We miss many blessings because we've been blinded from the truth. Read 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Read that chapter, the whole chapter. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. You'll find out that betrayal will keep you blinded from the truth. Because it said, if the gospel is hid, it hid to them who are lost, whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them. So if you allow the enemy to blind your mind, guess what? He's betraying you. He's deceiving you. He's duking you. He's making you think 
You can continue to live in sin and God going to bless you. Your blindness will keep you from receiving the promises that God has for you. They keep you locked in a dark place absent of the light. It is very important as a child of God to get in the word. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. It says, but if, I'm going to read an Amplified verse because this is really good Amplified. It says, but even if our gospel, the glad tidings, the good news, also be hidden, obscured, covered up with a veil that hinders the knowledge of God. So you mean to tell me I can be betrayed by the enemy from recognizing the gospel, right? So you mean to tell me that the gospel can be covered up? I can get an understanding, right? Why? Because of the veil that hinders the knowledge of God. It is hidden only to those who are perishing. If you are a child of God, this should not be about you. Because he says it's hid to them who are perishing. Those who don't know the gospel. Who never gave their life to Christ. And obscured, that means darkness. Obscured, absent of light. Only to those who are spiritually dying and veiled only to those who are lost. So if he's talking to the church, then why is he making this clear that you can be blinded from the gospel? It can be obscured from you. It can be covered up from you from seeing it. Why? Because you, you said so the veil is covered to where you're dying. You're decaying. You're corrupting. And you're lost because you still have people in the body of Christ who still have not truly gave their life to Christ. They're going through, they went through the process, went through the motions, did the prayer of confession to give their life to Jesus Christ, but they have not surrendered their hearts. So I can give my confession, sub Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior of my life, and never surrender my heart. So because of that, I allow the enemy to betray me. I allow him to blind me from the truth of God's word, so I never recognize that I'm lost. So I think I'm comfortable. I think I'm suitable with the way I'm living. But all the time, I'm perishing. I have no anointing. I'm dying spiritually because I'm not nurturing on the word of God. Let's examine this statement. If we look closely, we can see a progression. An offense leads to betrayal and betrayal leads to hatred. An offense leads to betrayal and betrayal leads to hatred. And we all know that's true. Some of you have been through that yourself. I've been through it myself before until God delivered me. As stated earlier, offended people build walls for protection. Our focus becomes self-preservation. Self-preservation. We must be protected and safe at all costs. How many of you know somebody like that? You might even be in that position yourself. Well, you're protecting yourself by a spiritual wall. It might be a wall from being abused, a wall from being hurt, a wall from being in a broken marriage, broken relationship, loss of a job. People talked about you. People were backbiting on you. And you got into a place where you built yourself in your fortress. We talked about this before recently. A lot of times 
We build our water protection to keep people from hurting us again. But all the time, we keep God from coming in. We have to be careful about the walls we build because of hurt and pain and, and disappointments. Because I build this wall, I can keep God from coming in behind that wall. Because I'm stuck in the pitfall of despair and refuse to rise above it. Because I've been hurt for so long, I feel that's a normal way of life. And God is saying tonight, it's going to cost you to stay behind that wall. It's going to cost you anointing. It costs you your knowledge. It costs you your wisdom. And it costs you your insight. It costs you from seeing God for who he is in your life. Because you allow yourself to be hurt and stuck in a place of pain where God can't heal you. But my Bible tells me, I believe it's Jeremiah 17, 11, somewhere around there. He says, I am the Lord, thank God, who healeth thee. God says he will heal you. God said he will deliver you. He will set you free. But the enemy comes along to keep you in a place of brokenness and hurt and pain and sorrow. When you lock yourself in your house, you go to work, come home, just lock yourself in the house, don't go nowhere, don't socialize with anybody else, don't go to church because I've been hurt. And many, time, many times, people in church hurt. Because they've been church hurt, I don't trust any other pastors. I don't trust no other churches because I've been church hurt. But you got to understand, everybody's not the same. Every church is not the same. Every pastor's not the same because they are pastors who have your best interest at heart who are there to preach the gospel to heal your brokenness and deliver you. But you got to be willing to allow the Holy Spirit to come in and tear down a wall. This makes us capable, makes us capable of betrayal. When we, be, when we, when we betrayed, when we've been betrayed, we seek our own protection or the benefit at the expense of someone else's. Usually someone, someone, with whom we are in relationship with end up suffering. Because if I've been betrayed by somebody else, the closest person to me is up feeling that the effects of that betrayal. Because now my attitude changed, my love for them changed, all because I've been hurt. And God is saying tonight, he can heal your brokenness only if you let him come in. You come in and heal your broken heart and bind your wounds. Thus, a betrayal in the kingdom of God comes when believers seek his own benefit or protection at the expense of another believer. And that's a true statement. Because I've been betrayed in the church by somebody in the church. I began to hurt other people because I've been betrayed. So I caused other people to suffer because I've been betrayed in the church. So my attitude towards other people, I should be loving and caring for them, is aggressive. Not only is it aggressive, but I have this defense about me where I'm ready to defend myself at any occasion, at anything someone says to me. Excuse me. And God is saying tonight, the closer the relationship, the more the severity of the betrayal. The closer the relationship, the more severity of the betrayal. To betray someone is the ultimate abandonment of, of covenant. People do it in marriages all the time. Become unfaithful. Stop loving the person who God gave you. You said God put you together. You get married. And all of a sudden now you start losing that love because it was infatuation and not love. So now you're trying to find love in somebody else outside of the marriage. Premarital affairs. Or something outside the marriage. Why? Because I've been hurt. I, I thought I loved this person. But I was only infected with them because of what they can do for me. How they can, can falsely satisfy me. So now I'm looking for other avenues to fill that empty space in my heart. So I find myself drifting off into an adulterous or a fornication relationship. 
And God is saying tonight, the more close the relationship is, the more severe the betrayal becomes. When betrayal occurs, the relationship cannot be restored unless genuine repentance follows. When betrayal comes, or when it occurs, the relationship cannot be restored genuinely unless the person has a sincere heart of repentance to allow the Spirit of God to bring conviction to your heart to forgive the individual who betrayed you, if you're the one that betrayed somebody, to repent to that individual, allow God to restore you to himself and the other individual who you betrayed, who you hurt. It's very important to let go of offenses. The Bible states clearly that anyone who hates his brother is a murderer and that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. 1 John chapter 3, verse 15. 1 John chapter 3, verse 15. And that is a very true statement. Because how can you say you love God and you hate your brother? He said, you're a murderer. You may say, how I murder somebody? Because of your attitude, because of the words you speak, the things you talk about about that individual. You're murdering them with your mouth. And God said, there's no eternal life abiding in you. So you got to allow the Spirit of God to cleanse your heart in order to change your conversation and change your mouth. In the, in, a, in, a, uh, in the Amplified Version, it says like this, anyone who hates, abominates, detests his brother in Christ is at heart a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding persevering within him. So you can't have eternal life living in you if you're a murderer. In your mouth, in your heart, in your mind. Because the mind, the heart, the will, the emotions all go together. So if one part is corrupt, the whole body's corrupt. And God is saying that you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You need to repent, give your life back to Jesus Christ, and go to the person who hurt you, ask him to forgive you, even though you ain't done unto them, forgive me for offending you. And ask them to, if, if, you know, if they don't come to you, never, never come to you and ask for forgiveness, guess what? You still got to forgive anyway. Because you're going to find out that people in society are not going to apologize when they do you wrong. Because their, their hearts are sinful. They're wicked. And they can care less if they broke you, hurt you, and scarred you. And then leave you and go do it to somebody else because of the type of mindset they have. The mindset on the flesh is an enemy of God. But the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. How sad that we can find example after examples of offense, betrayal, and hatred among believers today. It is so rampant in our homes and churches that it considered a normal behavior. That is a shameful thing to be happening in the body of Christ to where your wrong becomes right in your eyes. We betray each other, we hurt each other, we offend each other so quick we got hatred towards one another and becomes a normal way of life. We too, we, we are too numb to grieve when it's when we see ministers taking ministers to court. It is no longer surprising that when Christian couples sue another for divorce, church splits are common and predictable. Ministry politics are, be, are played in at all time high. It is disguised as being the best interest of the kingdom or, or of the church. So what it's saying here is that people are deceiving themselves and they call it church. They call it ministry. They call themselves a minister of God. They call themselves a child of God. But I'm quick to take you to court in relationship when we're going through divorce. I'm quick to, to tear you down in the body of Christ. And I say it's for the kingdom best interest. I disguise it as a kingdom of God and all the time the kingdom of darkness. Why? Because I allow myself to be betrayed by the enemy. Christians are protecting their rights 
making sure they are not mistreated or taken advantage of by other Christians. So we build up walls in the church. Individuals in the church build their own walls and they protect themselves from being hurt by other Christians. Have we forgotten to forgotten the exhortation of the new or the new covenant? Have we forgotten the exhortation of the new covenant? Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourself be cheated? First Corinthians chapter six, verse seven. First Corinthians chapter six, verse seven. Have we forgotten the words of Jesus? Matthew chapter five, verse 44. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. Have we forgotten the command of God? The command of God in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. To let nothing be done through selfish ambitions or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each other esteem one another better than himself. So the word of God, it validates the type of attitude, the type of behavior, the type of life we need to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. It shows us that we are without excuse if we allow ourselves to be betrayed by the enemy and hurt somebody else in the body of Christ or even outside the body of Christ because we are to be ambassadors representing the kingdom of God who God called to be in the ministry of reconciliation and yet we allow ourselves to be victimized by the enemy to hurt one another. So I, I pray this is helping somebody tonight. Why don't we live by these laws of love? Why are we so quick to betray rather than lay down our lives for one another, even at the risk of being cheated? The reason our love is cold, check this out, which is results in our still seeking to protect ourselves. So our love becomes cold in the body of Christ when I have my own ambition, my own self-gratification, my own desire of seeking to protect myself from being hurt. We can no longer confidently commit our cares to God when we're trying to care for ourselves. So I fail to trust God to take care of my situations and my problems when I build my own wall by seeking to protect myself. When Jesus was wronged, he did not wrong, he did not wrong in return, but committed his soul to God, who would judge righteously. We are admonished to follow his steps. We are admonished to follow the steps of Jesus Christ when we're wrong. First Peter chapter 2, verse 21 through 23. First Peter chapter 2, verse 21 to 23. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. So that is very important as a child of God to not render evil for evil. That's the reviling. But to give it over to God. Let God deal with the situation. Let God deal with the problem. Let God deal with the individual. i tell you one thing for sure. When you let God deal with your persecutors and your haters, that's when they become your elevators. That's when they become the person to build you when they're trying to tear you down. The enabler, the enabler. We must come to the place where we trust God, not the flesh. Many give lip service to God as their source, yet they live as orphans. Hear that? Many give lip service to God as their source, 
So you say God is, is the one who provides everything you need. God has the victory. God can take care of your enemy, take care of your adversary. But you live as an orphan. They take their own lives in their hand while they confess with their mouth, he is my Lord and my God. That's a terrible place to be in. False confession. A false livelihood. Because I'm relying on myself and not God, who is the Lord and Savior of my life. By now you see how serious the sin of offense is. If it's not dealt with, offense will eventually lead to death. But when you resist the temptation to be offended, hallelujah, glory to God, God brings us great victory. When you resist the urge, the moment to take the offense and deal with it in your hands, God brings us great victory. That's the enabler. The enabler is God who enables you to trust him at his word, who enables you to let go of your guard, to tear down your wall, allow God to come into your heart to take care of your enemy for you. God told Nehemiah, stay on the wall, build the wall. Don't worry about the enemy. He told King Jehoshaphat, when all the armies are coming against him, don't worry about this. I'll take care of your enemy. Why? Because God himself will fight for you when you learn how to rest in the victory of Jesus Christ. If the devil could have destroyed us whenever he wanted to, he would have wiped us out a long time ago. If the devil really wanted to destroy us, he had the power to destroy us, he would have destroyed us, wiped us out a long time ago. But thanks be to God who always gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord because he defeated the enemy to where the enemy had no power, no control over you or over me until we give him the power. An author wrote, C.C. Georgia, said, before I read this book, I was at the point of non-communication with God. I was saved but there was something between me, me and God, and my, me and God, that I was not that was not quite right. I knew the loss was not not the Lord's part on the Lord's part, but I just did not know what the problem was. I was at a friend's house one day, and she had the, had the bait of Satan by John Bevere. I brought it home and started reading it. I couldn't put the book down. It had an anointing so great. My spirit was just eating it up. About halfway through the book, I suddenly realized that the very thing that was standing between me and my relationship with the Lord was the spirit of offense. You can have a spirit of offense in your life and don't even realize it. And you hold on to that thing for many years, many generations that have been passed on to you from generation to generation before. And it prevents you from walking in your full potential living your best life in God until the Holy Spirit is invited to come into your life and reveal to you the underlying issues, the root cause. I learned that in elementary school, even in middle school, in high school, there's a cause and effect. There's a root cause to everything that happens in our life. But we have to sometimes ask God, what is the root cause of the reason why my finances always end up empty? What is the root cause why well, I'm always reverting back to the same old sinful habit I had for many years? What's the root cause why well, I always speak negatively about things that's going on around me and in my life? Guess what? The Holy Spirit himself will reveal to you exactly what it is when you allow the Spirit of God to come into your heart and begin to speak to you and show you your heart examine your heart and reveal the thing that's been lost in your heart and pluck it out. Then and only then will you begin to experience true freedom in Christ Jesus. As we come to a close tonight, we're going to pick up on this next week. How could this happen to me? How could this happen to me? Is our next subject in the book, chapter 3. And we're going to continue to feed on this word until we all get free. 
from something in our hearts that's offensive to God. You need to examine your heart to find out in your heart what is it that you allowed in your heart through yourself, through other avenues, through other people that have become offensive to God. And I guarantee when you ask God, the Holy Spirit is going to reveal to you what it is. And then allow the Holy Spirit to come into your heart to cleanse you from all filthiness of that root cause of that thing that held you in captivity, that you can experience true freedom in Christ Jesus, and he can cleanse you and make you whole by the Spirit of the living God. So, Lord God, tonight I thank you for this lesson. I pray that something has been said, O oh God, that will convict all of our hearts to want to change, O oh God, to become better and better in our life and relationship with you, O oh God. If there be any form of offense in our hearts, O oh God, reveal it, expose it, bring it to the light, that we can see what it is. If there's people in our circle who don't need to be around us, that you remove them, God, that you allow us to walk in true freedom and liberty in Christ Jesus and allow the blood of Jesus to cleanse us from all filthiness and sin. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want you to pray this simple prayer with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask the Lord you come into my heart, forgive me for my sins, knowing and unknowingly, and cleanse me from all unrighteousness, and come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. And I thank you for saving me now fill me with the power of the Holy Spirit to be a witness for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, the whole host of heaven is rejoicing over one sinner has turned his life over to Jesus Christ tonight. And a great celebration is being thrown in heaven in your behalf. Amen. Hallelujah. Also tonight, if you are a backslider and you prayed that prayer, God just restored you. He just redeemed you from the pit and the grips of Satan and brought you back to right standing and right relationship with him through, through his son, Jesus Christ. I want to thank you again for tuning in tonight in this lesson. I pray that something been said or done that would encourage you, that would edify, that would build you up in your faith to trust God and his word. And I guarantee the more you study God's word and hunger and thirst after righteousness, you shall be filled. So walk in your purpose for purpose. Walk by faith and not by sight. Allow the Spirit of God to draw you to the presence of the Lord every day until you get a rainbow word to set your day in motion that God will lead God and direct you in the way of truth and the way of righteousness. Amen. I did post the link tonight if anyone wants to see to the ministry, give an offering for the ministry, feel free to do that through the Cash App Avenue. I set, I set those links on here. Even also, you want to follow the other lessons. You may have missed some lessons you want to go back and hear, or you might want to just go to the previous lessons. All those lessons are listed in the link for my YouTube channel. Feel free to subscribe to my YouTube channel, and I guarantee you will be blessed and enriched in your spirit by the Word of God. You all have a good night. May the grace of God, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest through and abide in our hearts until we meet again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you got any questions or comments, feel free to send your comments. Inbox me at Charles Emery, uh, Charles D. Emery. You can inbox me your questions, and I'll answer your questions in the next lessons. Or if you got a question right now before we get off tonight, I will leave the line open for you to give a question if you have one, or a, con or a comment someone want to share. Amen. Spirit of offense, spirit offense can't recognize it until the Holy Spirit brings it to our attention. That's right. Amen, Pastor Denise. Thank you for joining in tonight. Amen. God bless you, uh, Sister Carolyn. Amen. And so, um, any other any questions or comments you want to post on here? I, I like the little emojis that was posted on here tonight. Praise God. <laughs>
Amen. Amen. I pray this is enriching to your spirits and to your soul. Because we have to study the word of God. We've got to know the word of God to defend ourselves against the trickery traps of the enemy that we won't fall blindly into his bait. Because Satan every day is setting baits for you to fall. If you're not aware of them, you're going to precariously walk right into a trap and find yourself in a situation that God did not intend for you to be in. But I see there's no other questions or comments. Y'all have a great night. And Lord says the same. We will resume again on next week, Tuesday at 6 o'clock p.m. You all have a great night. God bless you.